Hey, Merry Christmas to you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, join me with a word of prayer. I'll share with you what I got on my mind. Lord, thank you so much for these great folks, the opportunity we have uh, to discuss uh, who you are and the meaning of that for our lives and to celebrate this Christmas season. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, the joy that we all feel this time of year, the excitement we all feel. And so we pray for the next few moments, Lord, you would just kind of open our hearts. And our goal is the same, whether we're close to you or whether we're far away from you. When we leave this place, we just want to, we want to be a little bit more like you. So have your way in the next few moments we ask in your name. Amen. Uh, that, that's why we watch that movie year after year, and we've been doing it since the 1960s, or at least some kind of version of this particular movie. Uh, the Grinch is this mean-tempered individual, and the consensus among the people of Whoville is that the Grinch actually was born with a heart that was two sizes too small. Unable to stand the holiday any, any longer, the Grinch decides that he is going to, with his dog Max, decide they're going to destroy Christmas once and for all. So he disguises himself as Santa, heads down into Whoville, and then breaks into the Who's homes to steal everything they, they own and all the Christmas decorations and trimmings, and he takes it up to the nearby mountain where he's going to shove it off the edge of the mountain. But then on Christmas morning, he is shocked to hear the Who singing cheerfully, happy simply to have each other, and he then realizes <clears throat> that the holiday has a deeper meaning than, that he's never considered before, and the realization that Christmas is so much more than presents and decorations causes the Grinch's heart to change. In fact, rumor has it that the heart grows three sizes. And you and I, we love stories like this. These are good stories for us. It's why we find ourselves drawn every year to Rudolph or Ebenezer Scrooge or Charlie Brown and George Bailey. There's part of all of us that wants to believe that kind of change is actually possible. For me, for you, for people we love. And maybe that's why we're sort of drawn to the Christmas story as well. This hope that change is possible explains why people who don't even believe in Jesus or that Jesus is who he said he was still celebrate Christmas and still want it to be involved in those celebrations because humanity has a desperate need to believe that change is possible for anybody. So you know what word I've been thinking of this particular season when I see the Grinch story or <coughs> when I see the George Bailey story or even Elf story? I know I'm a little weird on this, but you know what word I've been thinking about? <laughs> it's the word amen or amen. How many amen people? Would you raise your hand if you say amen? Okay, how many amen people? Okay, uh, there, there's no right or wrong. But anyway, so amen, kind of, that's the word I've been thinking. I know it's weird, so just hear me out and see if you understand what I'm thinking about. Um, Maybe, maybe you use this word around mealtimes at your house. You know, maybe you've got some kind of prayer you all do, like God is good, God is great, thank him for our food, buy his hands, we all are fed, give us, Lord, our daily bread, and then someone says amen, and then you dig in and start eating. Or maybe somewhere along the way you learned the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you grew up in a tradition that said that a lot, and, and so, um, you know, that, that's a good thing. So I thought it'd be kind of cool if we said it together this evening, and I'm going to give you permission to read it up here so you don't have to close your eyes. You can actually keep your eyes open during the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I took this straight out of the King James idea. So we're going to read it that way. So let's just join this together. Uh, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Or, or maybe you kind of grew up in a tradition that didn't just say the word amen. It wasn't just something you said at the end of a prayer, but you all actually grew up in a tradition where, especially around offering time or maybe when a service began, you would sing the word amen. And when you sang the word amen, it usually sounded more like, more like this. Amen. Well, maybe that wasn't necessarily the style you grew up with. Maybe what you grew up with, it was kind of more of a song that the, everybody sang and sort of clapped. It was a more soulful version, less former, formal more of a gospel feel kind of amen, and it sounded something like this. Amen, 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 amen. Sing it one more time. Amen, 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 amen. 
Yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty awesome. Uh, you know, the tradition I grew up in, though, it, it, it seemed like uh, we, it, would, it should involve a tambourine. So you got anything that kind of would, like jack it up just a little bit? Yeah, we can do that. Hey, Stephen, hit it. Yeah, hey. <laughs> that was amazing. But, but what in the world does that word mean? If we're going to sing it all the time, we're going to talk about it. And, and what, what does it mean? And, and, and why are we talking about it at Christmas? Well, amen actually has a lot of meaning. So at the end of a prayer, like we did when the Lord's Prayer, or maybe when you're doing grace before a meal, it basically means so be it or, or truly. That, that's kind of you're agreeing with things. Sometimes during some uh, like preaching times in the middle of a prayer, you'll hear somebody kind of say amen out loud. And and in the middle of it, it usually means that you agree with what's being said. And so you'd say, uh, man, Tom really looks good this year. And you would say, yeah, well, you kind of missed your mark, but I'm going to pretend like you all meant to say it. And so you'd say you agree. (coughs) In scripture, uh, amen is sometimes used to actually affirm a blessing. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is from the book of Romans. It says, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So it's like, you know, yes, truly, may the God of peace be with you all. Je- Jesus used the word amen or amen as well. He used it a lot. When Jesus uh, used the word, he was saying, truly I tell you, or I'm telling you the truth. I'll give you an example of this as well. Um, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. That's your word amen. Same, same Greek word. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. This is actually the most popular usage of, of, of amen. In the first four books of the New Testament, this usage is used over 99 different times in the first four books of the New Testament called the Gospels. I tell you the truth. Amen is actually also used in Scripture to describe Jesus himself as his name. This is from the book of Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, actually talking about Jesus. And that's why I think of it this time of year, even in the movies and shows we watch as part of our Christmas traditions. The Grinch has his amen moment that truly Christmas is more than ribbons and bows. Rudolph has his amen moment that truly his shining nose could be used for good. Ebenezer Scrooge has his amen moment when he realizes truly a cold-hearted, selfish man can be redeemed and be transformed into a compassionate and sympathetic soul. And of course, my favorite George Bailey has his amen moment that truly his life has meaning and purpose. And so for a good many of us, Christmas is this amen moment because we use this time to remember an event that actually happened in history. And we're here today because we want to remember this event. We want our families to value and honor this moment. This Christmas, for some of us, this is the season of amen, a season where we say with our words and our actions, this is truth. This this is truth. And this truth is the center of the hope for change that we all have. A, A virgin named Mary gave given a child, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her soon-to-be husband, was told by the angel what was happening and that it was miraculous, a once-in-all-time event. And then Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem to be counted and as part of the census, and while they're there, the time comes for the baby to be born. And so Joseph gathers his little family in a barn because there's no room for them in the inn, and there, amidst the animals in the barn, in the humblest of beginnings, the Son of God was born. Shepherds were keeping watch of their flocks, and this massive angelic choir appeared in the sky, singing glory in the highest. And the shepherds were encouraged to go and see this once-in-all-time event, and so that's exactly what they did. 
There were some young, some wise men who were keeping, who were watching the stars and studying the stars, and they see a star they've never seen before, and they feel prompted to follow that star, and it guides them to Jerusalem, and they find the Son of God and give him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. That is the familiar story. That is the what of Christmas. Many of us can say amen to the what of Christmas. When you hear that, you say, truly, I agree. I, I, I'm with you. I understand that. We agree that's all part of Christmas, so we can say amen. But, but there's also a why of Christmas. God sent his son, deserves an amen, but why he sent his son maybe deserves an amen as well. Jesus voluntarily let go of his position in heaven and as the son of God and became like us. C.S. Lewis said That's, that humiliation would be like a human becoming a slug. And then God sent his son to the world of viruses and toothaches, to the world of pettiness and jealousy, to the world of pain and evil, of crosses and tombs. Which certainly makes us ask the question, why God became human and Baby Jesus born in a manger so that we could live with us. So when we're sitting around one day wondering what God is like, we could look at his son and say, well, that's God in the flesh. And when we have doubts about what we would, should do or what God would want us to do, we can read about what his son did and say, oh, there's what Jesus did. One of the Old Testament prophets records the Christ child, Christ child should actually be called Emmanuel, which means God is with you. God's with us. And the amazing thing about all of this is it was predicted hundreds of years before it ever happened. The prophecies were so specific, you couldn't even manufacture them if you're trying to fake it. In 700 BC, Isaiah says that a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. There simply have been no other virgin birth since. And then this baby grows to be a man. One of his contemporaries wrote that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. And at the age of 30, Jesus announces he had come so that anybody could be granted access to God's kingdom. And this invitation causes people to rethink how they think about everything. Themselves and their sin and other people and their future, their gifts. Jesus would teach and he would say things like, the kingdom of God is near, not something out there to contemplate and to deal with one day, but something that is actually close, something to smell, to touch, to experience in personal relationship. This Christ child, Jesus, the Son of God, would then be beaten and shamed and humiliated and crucified because the wooden manger always leads to the wooden cross. And it seems senseless, it even seems tragic. And yet Jesus said this had to happen in order to pay for the sins of the world on a more personal level to pay for my sin and yours. Right before he died on the cross, Jesus utters the words, it is finished, meaning the sins for the entire world for all time have been paid for by the blood of Jesus, your sin my sin, all of them. But this wasn't to be just a sacrifice. Apparently, this was also going to be a resurrection. And three days later, the Lion of Judah would rise up out of the grave, conquering sin and death, just as he said he would. Can you say amen to that? See, Christmas makes one ask two very important, enlightening questions. What kind of person do I want to be? What kind of life do I want to live? See, Jesus came to change you, to change me. That's why he came. He came to give us hope and a future. He came to give us life to the very full. But he won't force this on you. And he won't force it on me. God always waits to be invited. He always waits for you, for me, to choose 
He doesn't invite us into some list of rules and some practice of rule keeping. But what he's inviting us to is a personal relationship with him. Again, I ask, can you say amen to that? Maybe as you asked yourself these questions, you didn't like your answers. And if you didn't, well, you're pretty normal. (laughs) Maybe you're just being very honest. Maybe this has been a really tough year for you due to the decisions you made or decisions others made. For others, fears become a constant companion because of a diagnosis or a loss or a change in relationship status. Or maybe in this moment, you are so deeply aware of the sin in your own heart and life that you long for something more. This isn't the kind of person I want to be. This isn't the reputation I want to build. So what I thought I should do is invite you to say, amen. Is it time for you to acknowledge what is true? Is it time in your family for you to step forward and acknowledge what is true? Are you ready to receive the amen, the truth? Are you ready to build a new life on that truth? Are you ready to be a new creation, to be born again, because this is the perfect time to say amen? This is the perfect time for you to consider making that decision. And the way that decision is made is you find yourself believing it to be true. And you decide to take an action on that. You draw this line in the sand and you have a moment where you say, I want to follow after what is true. And I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Lord, thank you for these good folks. Thank you for the opportunity to share with them. Thank you, Lord, for the power of amen. And Lord, I do pray for the next few moments as we allow for some time of reflection and as we listen to what you might have to say to us, I pray that you would lead us to truth. You would lead us to amen moment. Lord, for my friends in the room who have never had that moment, or maybe it's been a long time, maybe this would be the time where they would say, you know what, I don't like the person I'm becoming. I don't like that my capacity to love is shrinking. I desire to follow truth. Just like the shepherds, just like the wise men, just like Mary and Joseph. And Lord, I pray that you would lead us into a personal relationship with you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.